separate gel electrophoresis choose a higher percentage gel to better separate smaller things and a lower percentage gel to better separate bigger things. This is because the percentage of the polyacrylamide or of the agarose in an agarose gel is going to dictate how meshy the mesh is. And basically the molecules, so whether it be protein or DNA or RNA, they're going to be traveling through this gel mesh. And the tighter that mesh is, the harder it's going to be for them to travel. Now the bigger guys are always going to have a harder time getting through and this is why these gels can be used to separate the molecules by size. But if the little guys can just kind of fly through the bigger holes, they're not going to get separated. But if you increase the percentage of the agarose or of the polyacrylamide, you're making that mesh going to be finer, the holes are going to be finer, and even those small molecules are going to be slowed down. But if they're too small, the bigger guys aren't going to get separated well. And so there's kind of this balance where you basically choose the percentage of the gel based on the size of the molecules that you want to separate. And you can look at like gel migration charts to kind of choose the best percentage where the thing that you're most interested in is kind of in the middle. That's where you're going to get the best resolving power, the best ability to kind of separate things that are close in size. What if you have a big, big things and small things that you want to separate? In this case, if you're using like a polyacrylamide gel, you often use a gradient gel. So something like a four to 20% um, or an eight to 16%, depending on what you're trying to separate. This can be really good if you're doing something where say you're going to be doing a Western blot and probing for proteins of very different sizes. But if there's a specific protein that you're interested in, you want to customize the gel to be in the range that's going to best resolve it. Um, so there are a variety of different precast options with percentages. Common ones are like um, 12 and 8 and 7.5 and things like this as well as gradients or you can make your own. And so I want to go into more of this detail about this as well as the same principles going to apply for agarose gel electrophoresis. But with an agarose gel we're typically separating bigger things. So big, big, big DNA and RNA. Um, so when we're doing various molecular cloning stuff like this, the agarose gels are really good for that. They're going to have these bigger pores than the polyacrylamide gels. Um, so the polyacrylamide gels are going to be better for smaller things. And I know it's weird, like we, uh, like proteins seem like they'd be really, really big, but compared to like the RNA that encodes those proteins, the instructions for making that protein, the protein's actually a lot smaller. And so we typically use a polyacrylamide gel when we're doing proteins and we're working with small, um, um, short pieces of DNA or RNA and then turn to those agarose gels when we're dealing with bigger things um, such as plasmids and various PCR products and things like this. We're typically using those agarose gels um, but for protein and the smaller pieces we're using polyacrylamide gel. This can be an SDS page, this can be a TBE, TBE urea, um, various things like that depending on what you're doing and I'm about to set up a gel. So here's more details on choosing one. I think it helps to start by thinking about what a gel actually is. Basically, it's a mesh filled with liquid. And this mesh is made up with, of these long chains that are kind of hanging out with one another. And so these chains can be agarose chains um, or polyacrylamide chains. And you can think of it kind of like being a sloppily knit sweater where you're gonna have different size holes and it's these holes that the, that the molecules are kind of going to slither through, um, being motivated to go through based on charge. You can kind of think of it as dropping jump ropes through a sea of basketball hoops. And so the bigger molecules, which are probably unfolded, if you're using a denaturing gel, they're going to be unfolded. So you have these long molecules kind of like slithering through and getting tangled up in this mesh. Whereas the smaller things are going to have an easier time and so they're going to travel more quickly and when you turn off the electricity, um, you freeze them in place and the smaller ones are going to have traveled farther so they're going to be farther along down your gel or near the bottom. And so basically, if you think about those holes or those basketball hoops, they're going to be different sizes. They're not going to be all evenly sized. Even if you have a set percentage of the gel, that's still going to represent kind of the average, there's going to be an average pore size that's going to be around whatever that percentage dictates, but you're still going to get a range. And this is going to make it so that you're able to separate things that are close in size as long as the 
the average pore size is going to be able to kind of differentiate between them. So if you think about a really big molecule trying to get through one of those um, one of those small holes, they're all going to have trouble. And so basically all of the big things were going to be concentrated up above and you're not going to be able to separate them. But those smaller things, if you had big holes, they're just all going to go at the same rate and go through together. So that wouldn't be able to separate them. But if the holes are of optimal size for the molecule, now you're going to get the, because you have those slight differences in the pore size, but all around that same size, you're going to be able to resolve or separate these things that are close in size. And so by carefully tailoring the percentage of our gel, we can carefully tailor kind of like the average size of those holes. And therefore, we can tailor it so that we're going to best be able to resolve the, the molecules that we're most interested in. And so if we're interested in separating really big things, we're going to want to use a low percentage of gel because the, here the holes are going to be bigger. And so the bigger holes are going to be able, the bigger, the our big molecules are going to be able to travel through them. But because there's going to be kind of around the size where it just starts getting uncomfy for those molecules, you're going to start seeing them being um, differentiated and travel at slightly different rates, even though they're really close together in size. If you have holes that are way too big for a molecule, so though if you were talking about like having the small proteins or the small nucleic acids that are traveling along that lower percentage gel, they're all just going to travel right through. And if they're all traveling right through unimpeded or barely, unimp barely impeded, they're all going to travel at the same rate. And so you're not going to get them to separate. And so a low percentage gel is not going to be good for separating small things, but it is going to be good for separating big things. In order to separate the small things, you're going to need a higher percentage of gel. With a higher percentage of gel, now those holes are going to get smaller and it's going to be less comfy for the small molecules to travel through. And so they're going to travel, um, they're going to start traveling more slowly. But those big guys, they're all kind of going to be stuck to the same extent. And so they're not going to separate out well. They might not even make it far into the gel. So if you have a specific molecule in mind that you're looking for and you know what size it is, you can then choose a gel with a percentage that is going to be optimal for that. And you can find one of the what the optimal percentage is by looking at like a, a um, protein migration chart or a nucleic acid nu migration chart. And we'll go into um, into these a little more detail. Um, and if you have a mix of protein sizes, then you're often going to use a gradient gel. I'm going to keep um, going back to protein, but the same applies for nucleic acids as well. And in, in fact, today I was running a nucleic acid polyacrylamide gel. And so we often, you, we can use polyacrylamide gels for either nucleic acids or for proteins. And we can use agarose gels typically for nucleic acids. So, but bigger pieces. So the agarose, you're going to get a less uniform mesh, and it's also going to be bigger. And so often the percent, we're typically doing like a 1% agarose gel. And here when we talk about percent, this is going to be percent weight volume. So it would be a gram per 100 mils if you were then a gram of agarose per 100 mils of your buffer if you were to make it. And this is a common percentage we use in the lab. It's really, really convenient. It can do like 500 to 10,000 base pairs, which is good for a lot of your molecular cloning needs. Um, but if you have something really big, then you want to go to a smaller percentage. And if you have something smaller, you'll want to go to a higher percentage. But if it's really small, you typically move over to your polyacrylamide gels. And so um, with the polyacrylamide gel here, you can do things like that are really, really small. So in grad school, I was working with microRNAs, which are about 20 nucleotides long, and I was using something around a 20% gel. Um, or you can go up to a lower percent or go down to a lower percentage to go up to separating bigger molecules. Um, so yeah, so basically you can use these these gels for different types, separating different types of molecules. And depending on what type of molecule you are looking for, you'll you can find different gel migration charts. And so here is an example of a chart from Biorad. 
Basically, when you're looking at one of these charts, it's going to be showing you where the molecules of different sizes would end up when the dye front runs out. So often when you load your sample, it's going to be in some sort of blue dye. And that blue dye, in addition to having whatever your sample needs to denature or whatever, it's also going to have that blue dye. Um, and so the blue dye is going to help you see when to stop your gel. And if you know that your protein or whatever is a lot bigger, you can actually run longer past the gel fr front running out. Um, but then the migration chart isn't going to be quite as um, close to what you were looking for. So here you can see basically from this example um, from for these protein gels from Biorad. I don't work for Biorad. This, they did not pay me to do this. Um, they just happen to have good charts on their website. And so it was a good example to use. You can see that they're showing you how proteins of different sizes would run in different um, percentages of gels. Um, so you can see that we'll compare like a 7.5%, so a lower percent, to a 12%, to a higher percent. So a 7.5%, we're going to have bigger holes, better for separating bigger things. And so you can see that you're going to have good separation of these large proteins. But you're not going to have good separation of those small ones. In fact, they might have even traveled off of your gel. And so if you're looking for those small things, you might not even, they might not even, um, you might not even be able to see them on your gel because they will have run out along with the ladder or along with the dye front. But what about a 12% gel? Here you can see those smaller things. But the bigger things are all going to be smushed together. And so you're not going to be able to tell them apart well. And the 10%, it's somewhere in between, but you don't get really good resolution of either the small things or the big things. But if you have something in the middle, well, now you have, you have better resolution of those. So you want to look and see where your molecule ideally is going to be somewhere in kind of the middle of your gel. Um, if you have the range, you need a range, you can use basically like a gradient gel. So such as a four to 15%, if you're interested in smaller side of things or four to 20% if you're interested also in the really big things. And so this is going to, these charts are going to allow you to choose the gel percentage that you want. And this is for the, they have precast ones, but you can also make your own gel percentage, it, your own gels, um, and you can do even further customization if you're making them yourself. Um, and so when you're making them yourself, basically in a polyacrylamide gel, you have these long chains of a, uh, you make, you actually cause the polymerization. So you cause the, you initiate the linking together of the monomers of acrylamide into these chains, into these polyacrylamide chains. And then those polyacrylamide chains are going to link up together. And this is how you're going to form the mesh. And so in order to link those chains together, you have brancher molecules. So some of the acrylamide molecules are only going to be able to attach kind of end on end, but other ones of them are going to be branchers. And so they're going to be, be able to like cross link. So basically they're going to be able to reach out and join these chains together. And so you can actually customize the, um, the amount of the, the monomers that just let you go um, link up like one over one, um, one to one, um, like kind of hand to hand, these long chains and the amount of those cross-linking ones that will allow you to basically link those chains together. And so you might actually see two different percentages if you're making the gel yourself, um, like on the solution, on the package, you'll see something like 29 per one or whatever. And this is basically, you can figure out the percent of the cross-linker. Um, and this can also influence the meshiness. But the percent T is what you're typically going to see, and this is just going to be the total monomer. So the um, the normal acrylamide and the crosslinker divided by the volume times 100. Um, so basically, you only you don't really need to worry about the percent C that much. But if you're making your own gels, that is something that you can play around with. Whether you want to have like this 3.3 percent crosslinker, we want to have the 5 percent crosslinker, um, and so you can customize things even further. Um, when you're making your own gels. The percentage that you're looking for typically is going to be the percentage of the resolving gel. So sometimes your gel is going to have a stacking gel and a resolving gel.
Sometimes they're not, sometimes they're just continuous, um, but sometimes you use the stocking gel, which has a lower percentage. Um, and so remember lower has those bigger holes. It kind of gets everything, all the molecules to the start line at the same point. Um, and so you might see a stacking gel on some, a stacking layer and a resolving layer on some gels. And typically the percentage, when you're talking about the percentage of a gel, that's referring to the percentage of the resolving gel. In addition to those charts for the proteins, you can also find information about the running of nucleic acids on poly polyacrylamide gels. Um, and here, how they run is going to depend in part on whether or not they're denatured, your gel is denaturing or not. Um, so in denaturing gel, you have something like urea, which is basically keeping things unfolded. Whereas in a non-denaturing, you don't have that. And so the molecules will maintain their structure, their um, strandedness and things like this. Um, and so they're going to run different. And the the dye molecules in your buffer are also going to, your loading buffer are also going to run different. So often your loading dye is going to have multiple dyes um, in it. And this is going to allow you to kind of watch the progress of the gel run. Instead of just having that one dye, you have multiple dyes often. Um, and these dyes are going to run like they were different size molecules. And so this is showing you, okay, well, if you have a 5% gel, the xylene xylenol is going to run like it was 130 nucleotides. But if a 6% gel, well, now it's running like it was 106 per six nucleotides. So how these dyes run is going to depend on the on the on the type of the gel and the percentage of the gel. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're running one of these one of these gels. If you have these multiple dyes, they're going to run, or even if you have a single dye, they're going to run differently on different types of gels. So that was the polyacrylamide gels, which again, we can use for either nucleic acids or for proteins, um, but we're using them for separating smaller things than we use the agarose gels for. And so for the agarose gels, here it's simpler. Um, we just have the percentage, we have that one percentage, which is just the grams per 100 mils. Um, and so if you want a 1% gel, you basically just take this agarose and you, um, you boil it in some sample buffer and then it's going to set. What's really cool about agarose is you don't have to do any of that polymerization. You already have these long chains formed. You just got to get them to tangle up and they'll do this themselves as long as you kind of um, dissolve them and then give them a chance to cool. And much more on this in other posts. But again, the higher the percentage of the gel, the, um, the smaller the molecules that you can separate. Um, well, and this lower percentage of the gel, the bigger the molecules you're separating. Um, you can sometimes, if you have like a, pre, a ladder with, um, or loading dye with various dyes in it, you can again see how they might run. Um, you can see how ladders would run on different percentages of gels, various things like this. But with the agarose, you typically just have that one choice, what percentage do you want? Uh, but you also have a second choice. You can choose what type of agarose you want. So sometimes you might want to use like a low melting point agarose, which is great for if you want to um, extract your DNA, your RNA from the gel. Um, and so you can easily remelt it around what you're looking for. But the key thing to remember is that no matter what type of gel you're using, it, whether it be agarose or polyacrylamide, no matter what type of molecules you're trying to separate, whether it be protein or DNA or RNA, use a higher percentage of that um, agarose or of the polyacrylamide, so a higher percentage gel if you want to separate small things and a lower percentage if you want to separate bigger things. Um, and it doesn't mean that the other things outside of that like range can't travel through the gel. They're just not going to get separated from one another very well. So hope that helped you understand gel percentages and how to choose.